you guys welcome to my August 5th DVD update. When I talk about the DVDs and Blu-rays I've gotten over the last two weeks or so, this actually I think has been officially two weeks since I did the last one. And a lot of pretty cool stuff, some cool horror stuff to talk about in this update as well. The first one I got, I had to get this one online because I couldn't find it in stores, and it's The Island of Dr. Moreau, which, you know, this is one movie that a lot of people have always, you know, said, why do you like this? But then I've seen like Entertainment Weekly saying how much they loved it in like a recent review. I've always really liked this film. You know, I like the original ones as well. I saw this in theater and for some reason I've always loved this and I know there's like a lot of stories behind this about the making of the movie and all the problems and the original director who I think was the director of Hardwire and a number of other other movies that I really liked he originally got fired after a week and then he ended up getting in makeup to stay on set to try and spy on what was going on because he wanted to be there so apparently he's one of the you know the you know, creatures on the film, the film, the whole time, but basically just to see what was going on. But this movie, though, is about um, a character who's on a lifeboat, and he's basically, you know, one of the last survivors on the boat. He ends up getting picked up, and um, Val Kilmer's character takes him to a, where he works on this island with, um, you know. Um, Marlon Brando, who plays Dr. Moreau and his daughter, and there's something very weird going on there with him, Dr. Moreau's character, turning, he basically is taking um, animals and using human genes and trying to turn them, you know, human-like. So it's all this weird stuff going on there. And I'm not going to ruin what happens. A lot of people know the story, though, but I really like this. I really love the music in this. I really love the lead actor, and I think the lead actor was in... The Omen remake, and he's been a lot of things. You know, he's a really good actor, the guy who was the lead. I don't know, this is just a very well acted movie. You know, it, although, you know, Val Kilmer gets a little over the top, and I love the over the top. Like, he becomes crazy at one point when he's trying to act like Marlon Brando's character. And I don't know, I just love all this stuff. It has, like, these, you know, amazing things like, what is the law? And, you know, these, oh, just all this stuff. And uh, Marlon Brando wearing this white makeup because he basically, in real life, he couldn't be out in the sun. I remember hearing all these stories too about him having an earpiece because he couldn't remember the lines so people were basically dictating them to him and at one point apparently he started like hearing in his earpiece reception about um, some Air Force thing or something he started repeating what they said I don't know this movie though is a great really weird movie I don't know I've always loved this one the next one I got is a movie from Paramount called Clue. And the cool thing about this, too, I want to mention, is it has, you can watch the movie with the, there was originally three different endings, so you used to have to see this in theaters, and it was kind of like random on which ending the theater had. And on this um, Blu-ray, and I don't know if the DVD had this or not, it basically can play randomly the different random endings, or you can watch it with, um, you know, uh, all three endings back to back, but each ending is like eight minutes, so it's a major difference because it, you know, if you haven't seen the movie, it's based on the um, board game Clue, and I think this is one of the first movies to be based on a board game, and I don't think there's really been another one in a long time since the Battleship one. I don't know if there's been a lot of other ones or not that I'm aware of. But the movie's basically about a group of people that come to a mansion, and Tim Curry is the butler, and they all basically get a letter. And like, if you've seen Scary Movie and House on Haunted Hill, it's kind of like that, too, in the second Scary Movie. And that's why it's so funny with Tim Curry in the Scary Movie 2 playing the butler, because he's kind of playing a similar character they did in this. But basically people get this letter that says your presence is requested here and none of these people know what they're doing there and they're basically trying to um, figure out what their purpose is there. And there's one character that ends up getting killed named Mr. Body and he gets killed and then it's them trying to figure out who did it and one by one other characters in the house end up dying off and it's them trying to put together who it is. Um, there's a lot of really good char uh, character actors in this too. Christopher Lloyd is in it. The one actor who was in Best in Show and all the Christopher Gust films played the neighbor in the Brady Munch movie. Um, he's in this film. Lots of really good actors. The one woman who was in the Pippi Longstocking movie as the woman who was head of the orphanage is in it. I don't know, this is a really good one, a really funny, like, a lot of real slapstick kind of falling down, over the top, some of the humor will go over people's heads, but I don't know, I've always liked this one, it's a really weird one, and, um, you know, though, too, when I think of Clue, like, the only movie I ever really thought of when I think of Clue, and the only time I ever really think of Clue, is when, you know, the game in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, when they're all playing Clue. This is definitely one to check out, though. The next one is from um, Echo Bridge. 
And this one, I'm really glad to see it's finally on Blu-ray, because when it first came out, I think back in 2008 or 2009, it only came on DVD, this is a really good movie called, it's called Blindness, and it's basically everyone in the world, all of a sudden, except for Julian Moore's character, um, though it's not everyone at first, it's not everybody, it's basically a select group, basically it starts off with this one man who is in his car, and then all of a sudden becomes blind, and then he's stopped in the middle of traffic, and a guy comes and helps him, ends up driving him home, then that person gets infected. So it's one by one people gets infected in the movie. Mark Ruffalo's in it playing the doctor, and he ends up getting infected because he ends up seeing the first patients. So it's basically Mark Ruffalo's, you know, married to Julianne Moore's character in the movie, and all the people who have gone blind get ended up getting taken and rounded up and put into this kind of compound, I don't know if it was like a jail at once at one point, but there's basically, they're basically, you know, locked in this place and Julian Moore can still see and for some reason she's been around all these people, she doesn't end up getting infected. So she goes with Mark Ruffalo and is in there and she pretends like she's, she's blind and she's helping people out in there, but she never lets on. And um, one by one, the place keeps on getting busier and busier, and more and more people end up going to this place. And you don't really know what's going on in the real world. You just know that more people are coming in there, and they're only given a small amount of food. And later on in the film, the main act of what happens in this is the things start going very, very bad in the compound and it gets to a very bad place. This is a really good movie like this. I really love the sequences too. Um, one point in the, you know, in the city and what's going on and stuff. I don't know, this is a really good one, a really good um, end of the world kind of film with everyone going blind. The other one that I really liked recently that kind of was like this was um, I think the perfect Perfect Sense, which is another really good one, but this is definitely one to check out. And I love too, you know, how they did it. they played around in the editing with the white effects and kind of blowing out the picture to be really white in a lot of sequences. Because because basically, like I said, everybody instead of going blind by seeing darkness, they just see white. And the other thing about it too is there's no explanation for why, because there's nothing wrong with anybody's eyes. And that's a real cool thing about it. It was just how all of a sudden this can happen. The next one is from. Um, I think it's from Anatomy Pictures. Now this one I want to first, before I start talking about it, let me say this is definitely a movie, you know, not for kids to watch, um, you know, not anyone under 18, and it's called The Bunny Game. And I've heard about this one for a long time, and um, it's very similar to tone, and a lot of people have compared it to Martyrs. And the basic idea of this is this is a woman who's a prostitute, and she ends up um, you know, shows her in the beginning what she's going through, and you know, except she's a drug addict and addicted to all kinds of drugs and things like that. And she ends up, you know, trying to hitch a ride, gets in a car with this, you no, know, gets in, yeah, a truck, like a, you know, big trailer with this guy who's a real creepy looking guy. Like she gets in the car with him, and he ends up basically, you know, knocking her out and putting her, you know, tying her up and putting her in the back of his truck, driving out into the middle of the desert, you know, away from anybody, and he's basically torturing this woman for days. And it's basically played almost in, you know, it goes through flashbacks to other people that this character is tortured, and it is very intense. It is totally the martyrs. You know, it's not a pleasant film to watch. But if you like Martyrs and you like things like that, this isn't one that I would like flock to watch again or anything, just because it's just hard. It's a really hard watch. And apparently the actress who was the lead in this had a very similar situation happen to her in real life. But it is very well done, very well shot. And the interesting thing is, too, that he had no crew when he did this. It was basically just him shooting it. And I can only imagine how hot it must have been in the back of that thing, shooting the desert. But this is very well done, though. Like I said, though, real intense. The next one is one that I like. This one was um, Elizabeth Olsen called um, Silent House. And it's a remake, and I've yet to see the original one, but it's basically her, and it's played in real time with no cuts. There are cuts in it, though. You can see a couple sequences where they cut, because you know, it would be impossible to actually do it with one take, because if you did, the amount, the amount of times you'd have to relight certain sequences, you could just would be impossible. But it's about this um, father and daughter who are in the house, 
and um, the father goes missing and the things that happened to uh, Elizabeth Austin's character. And Elizabeth Austin did a really good job. She was also in the uh, Marley or something, Ohio. I can never remember the name. But she was really good in that one, too. She's definitely, out of all the Austin, Austin's twins and Austin's, the best actors. This is definitely one I like, though. The next one is, this is one that I've liked since it came out. And I can't remember if I saw this in theaters when I was younger or not. But it's Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence, and there it's, it takes place, I think, the 1930s in the South, and um, Martin Lawrence's character is kind of has has some money, but I think he just got a really good job, but then he hasn't gotten paid yet. He's kind of in counting on getting paid, and then Eddie Murphy's character ends up stealing money from him or something. But basically, long story short, they end up um, getting a, Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence's character end up helping to go. They go to get a bunch of alcohol and they make a stop along the way because it's during the time when prohibition you know alcohol is like you know illegal and they have to go through all kinds of channels to get it but they end up having all this alcohol and end up getting accused of killing this person because he falls into them it's basically a whole bunch of stuff going on but long story short like I said they end up getting put in jail for life and it's them in jail and all the kinds of experiences on this you know terrible kind of jail out in the middle of nowhere and it's like basically on a plantation and all the things that have happened and the times they try and escape and Miguel Nunez is in this. There's a lot of really cool character actors. There's one scene too that I always remember. I always remember when it first came out and um, it, you know I think it's kind of one of the most memorable movie quotes in like the top ten and if anybody knows what I'm talking about you can post below but like it's just this one I just never forget. The next one I got and this one I was I had never heard of this one and I really was looking forward to seeing this and it's called First Born and it's the first Corey Haim film that he ever did. It was before Lucas and before um, um, Silver Bullet. And this is basically about Terry Garr's character. You know she was from Tootsie and a lot of movies and and Peter Weller who was in RoboCop playing RoboCop in the first two movies. Um, the third one, I never I always forget that he wasn't in that one. That's why that one wasn't that great. But um, Firstborn, she's basically a... She basically, two years ago, had gotten divorced from her husband. And she's trying to find someone else. And she ends up getting with Peter Weller's character. And he, you know, basically at first is doing everything he can to try and get, you know, on the good side of the kids and getting, you know, getting the one kid a motorcycle and, you know, getting the one kid a dirt bike, doing everything he can to sort of get on their good side. Once he ends up moving in, things get bad and he's into drugs and getting, you know, her, you know, the mother into drugs and all these terrible things going on. He's real abusive and um, there's a real cool song too in this they have in the opening menu. This is a good one though, real, real dramatic, real depressing at some points of this. But I really like this though. It was one, like I said, it was one I never saw before. For. And, you know, I pretty much try and own all the Corey Haim films and Corey Feldman, but Corey Haim de like, was always one of my favorites. But this is definitely one to check out. The next one is from Horizon Films from Kino, and it's Mr. Hush. Now, I've, I've heard about this one from a really long time because I know Edward X. Young, who played Mr. Hush, we did a um, movie together. It's not out yet, but it was, we did a film together. And Jessica Cameron, I've talked to a lot. She's an independent film actress. And the, basically, the, the plot of this, I know I say basically a lot, sorry. But the plot of this is that it opens up with um, Brad Lurie, Lurie's character and his wife, played by Edward X. Young. And it's Halloween. They're there with their, their daughter. They basically just got back from trick-or-treating. And they get a knock on the door, and it's... Um, Mr. Hush character, you know, Edward X. Young, doing a um, accent, like an Irish accent, to get inside saying how um, his bus broke down with his congregation, can he use the phone, and letting him in ends up being a terrible, you know, mistake, and he ends up slitting, um, killing his wife, and kidnapping his daughter, and it's ten years later, and um, Bradley's character is a disaster, he's got long hair, living out in a tent, and he's basically on the run, you know, not really on the run, but sort of trying to hide out, and at the same time trying to find Mr. Hush and find his daughter. And, you know, all in all, I thought this was okay. You know, it wasn't a, a perfect film. Um, I thought it was a little bit with some of the acting, a little over the top, but I really, really liked 
Edward X. Young. Edward X. Young as Mr. Hush is outstanding. And same with Stephen Joffrey's. Like, I wish Stephen Joffrey's was in more of this. He's great. You know, I've been a fan of him since Fright Night. And I thought he did a really good job in New Terminal Hotel, a movie that was from about 45 years ago. That I don't think hardly anyone saw with him and Tiffany Shepis, which is definitely, in my opinion, probably my favorite Tiffany Shepis film. And like I said, hardly anyone saw that one, and it was so good. And um, I'm not going to ruin the twist of who, what Mr. Hush is, but oh, I thought this was, you know, if you like horror movies, you know, like I do, I thought it was an interesting movie. Not a perfect film, but, you know, pretty well done for the most part. I like the music, too. They had the guy from Huey Lewis in the News, I think he was one of the singers, do the end credit, you know, the Mr. Hush song, which was great. And um, Brian O'Halloran has a part in it, and I'm not going to say where. I don't know if he's credited or not, but he is in it, so don't turn the movie off, you know, until you see him. But anyway, though, this is definitely one to check out. The next one is from IFC Films, and um, this is one that I, I saw, I watched before on demand, and really like this one, and it's called ATM, and it's with Josh Peck, who was um, from Drake and Josh, and Mean Creek, and what else was he in? He was in a bunch of stuff. You know, he used to be heavier when he was a kid, so he used to always know him as, like, the fat kid in movies. But he was outstanding in this. And it also stars her Alice Eve, who's been in so many things lately. The Men in Black movie, um, Decoy Bride, tons of stuff. But it starts off with an office party, and Josh Peck and his friend that he works with there. And he ends up wanting, uh, I think it's Josh Peck or the friend wants to get out of there, and he has to drive... Um, Josh Peck home. Alice Eve asks if she can get a ride too. And he, the, Josh Peck's friend, always you know has liked Alice Eve's character and kind of been afraid to say anything. They end up you know, you know, wanting to go home alone. And of course, Josh Peck has to come along. They and Josh Peck's like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of hungry. I want to get something to eat. And he doesn't have any money, so they end up stopping at the ATM, which is a terrible mistake because when they get in there, they all end up going in and they see. Um, some guy standing out there really weird, like far back, and you know, you're always afraid when you go to ATMs you're going to get robbed and stuff, so they're very freaked out. They start to leave, and the guy starts coming closer. Then they end up witnessing the guy kill someone with a dog and know that they're deep shit. And it's basically them stuck in this ATM, and they didn't have their phone, and what are they going to do? And with this crazy guy out front, and you know, there's a really, really good twist to this movie. This is, I really thought this was really well done. Suspense. I like these kind of movies set in one place. When they're done well, and this one was. I thought it was well acted. All in all, though, this is a good one. The next one, and I've heard some mixed reviews on this, and I don't know, I thought this was pretty good. I mean, there's, uh, you know, a little overuse of some of the stock footage and things like that, but... You know, the actual performances and William Defoe in it, he's, I mean, William Defoe is always good. Natasha Leone, you know, from But I'm a Cheerleader and lots of stuff, has a small part, and I was glad to see her in something again. And it's called 440, The Last Day on Earth, and it's basically the end of the world is coming at 440 a.m., and it's William Defoe and his wife living, you know, they're living on this really expensive loft in New York. And, you know, it's their last night. They're basically, she's painting, he's talking to friends on Skype and trying to talk to his daughter. And it's basically, that's really all it really is. It's just sort of their relationship and kind of arguments they go through. Um, you know, his you know current wife overhears him talking to his ex-wife and gets upset. So there's all kinds of things, you know, going on and just like watching things uh, with the, you know, Dalai Lama and all this kind of stuff. You know, like I said, there was a little bit of an overuse of some of the stock footage. The ending was great. It, like I said, the stock footage, some parts, like I said, went on a little much and kind of took away from some of the stuff. But William Defoe was really good in this. I mean, I, I really don't think he's ever given a bad performance. I think it could be a movie of anything and he'd be good in it. You know, he definitely is, in my opinion, one of the top actors. Like, so many things he's done that I've loved. The Shadow of a Vampire, it's one people don't talk about much. You know, it just goes on and on. But this is a really cool one. Like I said, Natasha Lone has a small part in it. And um, it's a really pretty good end of the world one. It really just focuses on people, their last hours of life. And it, it was good. The next one is from Lionsgate. And I was really interested in seeing this. And this one was absolutely outstanding. It's called The Monitor. 
And the star of it is Naomi um, Pace, I think. I think that's how you say her name. And she's from the original Girl with the Dragon, Dragon Tattoo trilogy. She was just in Prometheus as, as the lead. And I think she was in the new Sherlock Holmes film. And this was a really pretty good one. Now, her character is um, just moves to a brand new apartment complex with her son after she's gotten divorced. And there's all these hints that the, and you know, talks in the movie about how the son was abused by the father. And the father is, you know, basically she's become petrified of the son getting, you know, being 10 feet from her. She basically has to be around the son all the time. She can't, the son can't sleep alone, even though he wants to. She has to sleep in the same bed with him, you know, and she ends up trying to finally give him some space and she buys a baby monitor from like a Best Buy kind of place. And um, when she, and she becomes friends with the guy who works there. When she buys that at night, she ends up hearing someone screaming on the monitor and uh, it totally freaks her out. She runs into the son's room and it wasn't there. It's basically something is going on and somehow she's getting this signal and she's trying to figure out what's going on and if the person lives in the house. Yet at the same time there's, um, you know, she's very, she's really nervous because the son is having all kinds of problems in school and um, social services is talking about reopening the case and questionably taking the son away from her and putting him back with the father because they're starting to not believe that it's true, you know, what the father did. You know, and the payoff this movie is, is really good and very, very unexpected. This is one I would highly recommend. Definitely watch this one. It's called The Monitor. The next one is from Lionsgate as well. It's the complete final season of the Ninja Turtles series. And it's actually from... T I, I didn't remember that the show went to 1996. I totally forgot that it went that long. And I didn't know it was on until I was like 11. I didn't know that. And it's the final season of this. And, you know, with me and Ninja Turtles, this was like something that I totally grew up watching. I remember having, the, as a kid, someone dressed as the Ninja Turtles to my party, you know, one of my birthday parties. Um, this is something I always watched when I got home. This around the same time I was watching Pee Wee on TV. I don't know. This is just a really good one. And it's finally glad to see that the final season of this is out. So if you're a Ninja Turtles, Turtles fan, definitely check this out. It has the last episodes and then two bonus episodes and um, inter bonus introduction but definitely check this out if you're a fan of the Ninja Turtles. The next one is another movie set in one place and this is from Inception Media and this the main person I was so excited to see in this is Buzz. Um, Brad Renf no not, not Brad Renfro, you know, what's his name? I never remember his name, I just always call him Buzz. Is his name even mentioned on here? You know, Devin Rattray from Home Alone and Home Alone 2. He played the brother and he was in Little Monsters as the bully. And I think he was recently in Surrogates, the movie. And this is about a group of people who end up on an elevator, you know, just going up on an elevator to this um, company party. And the, um, the person running the party is in the elevator and a bunch of his employees. And it's supposed to a whole bunch of people going up just on an elevator to the company party. And um, the co head of the company is dumb. Grand granddaughter is basically really causing problems on there, and he she ends up pushing the button because the one guy in the front of the elevator is the comedian, and he's freaking out, going, "Oh, I hate tight spaces. I I can't handle this." And I went house is taking so long, so it's, you know they got to go up like 50 flights, and she ends up pushing the stop button, and by doing that, she ends up getting the butt the elevator to get stuck, and they end up stuck on this elevator, which is awful and no one is helping them and they come to find out that one of the people in the elevator and you find this out very early I'm not going to say which person has a bomb strap, strapped to him or her, her, her that cannot be stopped and they have got to find a way all out of this elevator and it's all kinds of stuff going on this was really really good um, you know I, a lot of people are going to compare it to Devil I kind of like this a little bit more than Devil and it has, like I said, the kid, you know, Buzz from Home Alone. The stand-up comic was from Blast from the Past. The one who ends up going, get away from my elevator. You know, had the cross or X thing on his head, kind of like Charles Manson that. Um, the one guy was the boyfriend in, uh, the, I think with the head of the paper that Gina Davis worked for in The Fly. A lot of people are in it. This is a really good one. The next one is from Millennium Entertainment and it's called Lada Land. I think that's how you say it, Lada Land. It's about a family that ends up moving into this really expensive home complex and um, they end up being all kinds of these, something's going on there, like noticing this kind of 
um, spirit kind of thing. And the one the wife is like seeing this thing with squiggle up faces and the weird neighbor. And it's like that kind of thing. It's like the ring and all that kind of stuff. Very similar to all that kind of thing. And um, their one neighbor is like, you know, always yelling at this wife and all these things going on. So it's you kind of trying to figure out what's going on. The family is all dealing with this. And at the same time, the, the husband who just bought this house is dealing with his job, which is not going so well. And he doesn't know how he's going to afford this place. And if he really wants to stay here, because the, everyone's, it's the youngest daughter who ends up getting haunted by this thing and seeing this thing. And he doesn't want to believe it. So that's basically what it is. It was pretty creepy. It was a little bit long, I would say, but it was very creepy. And these kind of things always freak me out. Like, like the scary weird faces and stuff. And this really weird old woman in a wheelchair like this. And like it, it was weird. It was it was well done though, and it has an opening music. It kind of reminds me of Bless the Beast and the Children, done in a weird instrumental. The next one is from TLA releasing, and it's um, Mary Marie. This was a really good one. It was about uh, these two girls who were sisters, who I think it was their mother had recently just died. And they end up going back to the summer home where they grew up and because their father is pretty much going to be selling this place off very soon. They do with their father or grandfather. They, they don't talk too much about it. Like, that was the only complaint I had was it just got a kind of confusing in a few parts. But it does make sense why they didn't go into too much of it. But they end up going back to this place. And these sisters have a very weird kind of relationship going on. You don't know what's going on between the two of them. It's a little bit like Heavenly Creatures, you know, um... And you just don't know what's going on because it kind of weirds everybody out because everybody knows they're sisters and they're kind of, you know, hugging up on each other a little bit and like all this kind of stuff going on. And then the one sister ends up, you know, become, getting interested in this kid, um, neighbor kid. One of, one of the kids that works in their store, he's like around their age, that comes to help them fix up the house to sell it off. Then the other girl notices this and ends up starting to get it, you know, interested in him, you know, sort of basically she's going after him just to, be cut, to make the other one jealous. And it comes it comes into all those kind of things going on. And, um, you know, I thought it was a really well done one, though. Um, I like this a lot, you know, and I don't want to ruin the end, but I, you know, I thought it was interesting, too, what they said at the end. This is just a really good, you know, this kind of discovering yourself kind of film. And, you know, really well acted. The two leads, the two girls were really good. And um, I like this a lot, though. And the next one I got from Walmart, and it's Dead Season. I think it was only like $10. Um, I don't think they put a Blu-ray of this out. And um, it's about a, you know, end-of-the-world zombie film. I always, you know, I pretty much watch every zombie film that comes out. I, I think, I don't think there's really any that I've never watched. And it's about these, um, these, this, People that end up, uh, you know, everyone's sort of like living on their own, doing their own thing. This guy ends up meeting this um, girl and this kid, and they end up, you know, trying to get, you know, getting on a boat, hoping to find an island. And when they get on the boat, the little kid, you know, in the beginning ends up getting killed, you know, getting bit. So it's basically just the two of them. And they end up coming up to this island. I think they're in Florida or something, so they end up getting to, like, Puerto Rico or something. I don't know where they exactly felt, you know, where the island exactly was. But um, they get to this island, and they think they're alone. kind of has a vibe of the, I think it was Zombie 4, I think, which was in the Philippines. A little bit kind of like a feel like that. They end up on this island, and it ends up being that there's these other people there. And they end up getting taken in, and end up living with these people and there's all these things going on with these people and the people are sort of turds too they're not really very nice and a little like kind of a day of the dead vibe going on um and them trying to find food and stuff because there was recently a ship that crashed and i th i thought it was pretty well done i found it too was shot in the 7d and it really you know shows too how when you really shoot these things well it can look really well done like really good i liked this though i thought this was one of the better zombie films in a while and the last one I got is one of the Walmart, um, and I looked through them trying to find which one looked interesting, the most interesting of them. It's the After Dark Horror Fest, not, oh, it's not After Dark Horror Fest, it's After Dark Action Collection. These are only at Walmart. They had a bunch of different ones. Like, I tried to find, like I said, this one looked the most interesting. And it's, um, Jim Cazell, you know, Jesus, and, you know, and it's basically about a family It's going on a trip, and the, hu and the husband... Is, was away for, for a while, so they're trying to kind of rekindle their, you know, family, because their family's basically falling apart. 
and at the same time a bank robbery happened, or I think it was a bank or a, no, it was a armored truck robbery, and they end up, um, the people who stole the money don't know what to do because it's a roadblock, so they end up stashing the money in the um, people's car, um, Jim, you know, Curzel's car with his family, and then they end up going after him, trying to find him. And it's all this, like, this race with the family, getting chased by them, and everything. I don't know, I thought this was a pretty good, you know, action film. It's interesting, this line, this After Dark, you know, action line. Hopefully they do more of the horror ones, too. But anyway, though, I thought this was a pretty, like, a pretty good one. But anyway, though, thanks a lot for watching, for subscribing. And I'll see you guys in probably, like, close to two weeks or so. See you guys later.